Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. Hello to everyone around the world. It is wonderful to see so many people from so many different countries calling us today for this webinar on misinformation and disinformation, which is, of course, part of a wider speaking series that we had on uh, different topics such as negotiating humanitarian corridors, negotiating protection and outcomes in conflicts or occupied areas. And today we will be looking more closely on the impact of misinformation and disinformation on humanitarian negotiation. My name is Fiorella Erni. I am the head of operations at the CCHN and I will be your host today. Misinformation, disinformation circulating in a country in a society or community definitely has a great impact on our humanitarian negotiations. We have seen this during the COVID-19 pandemic. We are seeing this in recent conflicts that are going on and of course on various other occasions. The CCHN has been carrying out research on this topic um, since 2020. And of course the impact that it has on humanitarian negotiation and currently, actually this week, we are engaged in a peer workshop for communication professionals. And I see some of the colleagues who are in the peer workshop are also listening in today. So welcome to everyone. Today, we have um, three guests who will be speaking about their experience in the field. We have um, with us Sandrine Tiller. She is a strategic advisor at MSF. We also have Anahia Ayala who currently works for UNHCR, but she will be sharing her experience that she has gathered as a humanitarian consultant in the past. And we have Anastasia Marchuk with us, who is currently the ICRC head of subdelegation in Odessa. Welcome everyone um, to the speakers. We are very much looking forward to hearing your experiences. We will now start and see what our panelists are saying on the topic. And what they or what their strategies are to counter mis and disinformation campaigns. So I am very happy to give the floor to Sandrine Tiller. As I mentioned before, she works at MSF as a strategic advisor, and she will speaking about what is misinformation, disinformation and hate speech and on an understanding how false information can be used to harm humanitarian operations and vulnerable populations. Sandrine, the floor is yours. Welcome. Yes, good, good, uh, good day. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Sandrine Tiller, and um, for the past two years, I've been running a mis- and disinformation uh, project for MSF. And our approach was really to um, combine reflection with action. So we wanted to understand, look into the phenomena, but then also really find quick strategies to help our colleagues respond. So um, I'm just going to talk you through, I guess, a little bit the framing of the issue and um, also some of the examples that we encountered and some of our strategies to respond. Um, and of course, you know, uh, there'll be questions afterwards, so I'm happy to receive those. So just to start really to say that, yes, we're living in a changing in information environment. This is a photo from South Sudan, and you can see, okay, there's not a lot of great mobile reception, but even in the remotest areas, people are accessing the internet and are able to receive and send information. So I think, yeah, that's kind of an obvious starting point, but um, even I think with some of our colleagues, we, we need to shift this mindset that actually, you know, people are in an information desert they're they're not um so how ah, let me just try and ah there we go so why did we start looking into this well really there are kind of two sources the first was that we were seeing um it was just the beginning of covid we were seeing how misinform health misinformation was actually affecting trust in healthcare providers. I know Anahi will be talking about that in more detail, but for us, that was a really big concern. And then secondly, we could really see how there was a growth in disinformation operations. And we had the worry that 
humanitarian agencies could be targeted. And of course, you know, the White Helmets is the, the classic, the, the nightmare example of um, a disinformation operation against a, a humanitarian organization. So just to start, um, I will give you a few definitions and I could share this slide in the chat so you don't have to take notes on it. Um, but basically, yeah, there is a whole spectrum of what is called the information disorder. Um, but we use these four terms uh, in MSF and I know ICRC has a very similar um, kind of setup. Um, there are others, but um, yeah, so misinformation is really about the intent. Um, so it's false information, but shared without intent to harm. So for example, a rumor that goes around saying that, you know, garlic can cure COVID. So it's not, it's not correct, but it's shared without an intent to harm. Um, disinformation has this intent, um, which is to um, actually harm people. So it's something like, you know, uh, uh, humanitarian agencies are um, infecting people with dangerous diseases through um, COVID vaccination. So that would be disinformation. Malinformation is when you have this combination and true of true and false information. So for example, you would say, you know, Sandrine Tiller uh, works with MSF and she's running a secret program to clone giraffes. So there you have kind of true information, myself, my job, um, but the false information about my secret cloning project. Um, then we have hate speech, which is really about targeted information aiming to harm particular groups or people. Um, and we've seen this happening in a horrible way in places like Ethiopia, um, where you have this ethnic um, hate speech uh, that is being propagated online. So those are some of the definitions, but as I said, we really see this as a kind of spectrum. Um, and there's a kind of churn. Uh, when I had my first meeting with Anahi, she, she was telling me, and it was so, I, I've seen it so true, how actually we're all living in a kind of churn of false, true information that is all around us. So in a way it's, it's hard to parse these out, but it just helps to have this framework. So how does this affect MSF's projects? I'm gonna talk about MSF because that I think is the easiest way to share with you our experience. Um, so firstly, I'll just give a few examples. Um, for example, in Yemen, when COVID hit, we uh, discovered that actually our patients were arriving late and with kind of severe complications on COVID. And it turned out that there was a rumor that um, if you go to hospital, you will be given a lethal injection and uh, you will die. So that rumor, if you think about it, is probably a combination of people's fear, the fact that actually some people do die in hospital, maybe quite a few people in the case of the COVID epidemic. Um, but then you also have this kind of falseness about it, so that the intention of, of, the, of the caregivers. So for us, this meant to really a kind of combination of approaches. And um, one of the things I really want to emphasize in this workshop is that from our perspective, this is not just a comms issue. And at least in MSF, we found a lot of colleagues kind of thinking of this because it's mainly on social media as just a comms issue. I include in my little diagram for my colleagues, all of our different departments. So our operations, security, obviously IT and cybersecurity, legal department, um, advocacy, uh, negotiations, relationships. So all of that is part of responding to mis and disinformation. Um, it may be that the comms or the digital officers are the ones you know, actually crafting the messages to go out on social media, but we definitely see responding to this and disinformation as a, as a whole organizational approach. And we really put the emphasis on operations. Um, Myanmar is another example. Uh, since the coup, 
happened, we found that actually the online environment is a kind of virtual battlefield. And you have a very interesting dynamic there where you have uh, Facebook being used, for example, by the um, civil disobedience movement to organize and source, uh, crowdsource medical assistance and also resistance efforts. You have on TikTok, uh, military campaigns to motivate and mobilize soldiers and also to propagate hate speech. You have then on Twitter, um, the kind of public messaging for the international community under the hashtag, what is happening right now in Myanmar. So you have different platforms being used in different ways by Myanmar population, and each of them trying to pull the narrative to their side. Um, for us, we had a concern at the beginning of this um, when the coup first happened, of the phenomenon of social punishment, uh, which is where the civil disobedience movement was actually kind of outing and shaming uh, people who were considered to be collaborators. And because most of our projects actually were working directly with the Ministry of Health, um, and we had a lot of interaction with Ministry of Health, you know, for management of chronic diseases of, of our patients, um, we were worried that our uh, colleagues are not, uh, would be targeted by uh, online uh, attacks. So um, we did a little piece of research about that. And of course, we found that the issue was far more complex. Um, and you have a whole interesting dynamic between uh, people's how they are in, in real life and the nuances, and then how they present themselves online as well. Something to discuss in the, in the discussion afterwards. Um, and then Ukraine. Uh, so in Ukraine, we have, yeah, conflicting narratives online. One could say maybe <laughs> clashing realities. Um, for us, what that meant is we had to really intensify our social media monitoring, um, not only looking at, you know, any MSF mentions, but also looking at what is being discussed in, uh, in Ukrainian media and social media, but then also in Russian media and social media, so that we would have the overview of what are the narratives um, very complex and very difficult for our teams to really monitor what's going on. But it, this social media monitoring, we think, is actually a really essential part of basically being um, understanding the context. So those are just three um, examples from our operations. What are we doing about it? Well, we've taken a two pronged approach in our project. Um, the first is really at community level with the communities where we work, and this is about trying to better understand what is called, and um, I really want to name check Internews for this because they've done an amazing job at um, developing a methodology called the information ecosystem analysis. So really, for us, it's about understanding that actually, it's not just about misinformation and people getting the wrong information. It's about understanding, firstly, what is their information environment? What kind of information is coming back from the community? Um, some We noticed that in one of the pilots that we were running in Somalia that actually some kind of critique against MSF had been labeled by our colleagues as misinformation uh, because it was incorrect. And I felt like, okay, we need to rethink this terminology because it's very judgmental. And obviously, you know, sometimes you're just getting feedback. It may be negative, it may be wrong, but um, it's, it's more about learning to listen to the community and then have this kind of two-way communication um, and develop this trust. And I know Anahi will be talking about that later on, and I'm sure Anastasia will talk about that too. Um, the second part of our response is really about managing digital risks. So there we're talking not only about disinformation, but about, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, social media monitoring to really understand what's going on. Um, you, to use a technique called pre-bunking, 
which we're actually, we're just about to develop some internal training on that, which is really to try and kind of set the scene for our activities. Um, I'm sure Anastasia will talk about that too. It's about explaining how you work, what you're doing, and if you're going to be doing something that might be seen as controversial, say vaccination or providing safe abortion care in a country where it's illegal, you will have to basically set the scene so that you actually um, fill the space with good information about your work. Um, we also set up a crisis response for critical digital incidents. And one of the things uh, I'm really keen to do is to really integrate digital security in our security framework. Um, you just have to think of an online death threat. If any of us would receive that, I would hope it's considered as a security incident and that it's investigated and that there is a kind of security response. Um, not that it's seen as a comms issue. Um, so developing a crisis response for us has been a really key thing. We've trained up some of our staff. We've also done some disinformation simulation exercises um, to really kind of prepare ourselves for a kind of reputational, viral, uh, you know, attacks against us. And that's meant for us actually developing our contacts with the tech companies. It's really difficult. If any of you have tried it, you will know. We are, you know, big cheese in our own little world. Um, but in the big wide world, uh, we're very small players and we don't have the big bucks. So Facebook uh, or Meta, TikTok, et cetera, we're just total small fry for them. So it's been really hard to get contacts and YouTube is still um, almost inaccessible to us. Um, but we have managed to get some good contacts with these um, companies, basically to have a kind of red telephone to be able to call them if we have an attack against us. Um, and also to be able to um, share with them, because most of the tech companies, at least Twitter and um, Meta have this, they have human rights teams, so we can also kind of bring evidence to them about particular cases. We're not yet at the stage of actually bringing this kind of evidence because it's a bit too much for us, I would say. Um, but I hope that eventually we are able to have a kind of robust policy and even advocacy towards um, the tech companies uh, on things like hate speech um, and, other, and other issues. Um, stigmatization, that kind of thing. Okay, um, my final slide. This is just to say that for me, um, I feel that it's really important that we keep the reflection element of on mis and disinformation because it really is about understanding how the digital world, the online world, is affecting the societies that we live and work in. Um, there is such a thing called the digital anthropologist, and I think it's a very cool sounding job. Um, but basically, yes, it's changing our society and we need to understand it better. So, all right, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Sandrine, for, for framing this conversation in, in such an interesting and informative way. Um, we're taking questions after, so if anyone has questions for Sandrine, please feel free to type them in the chat or write them down and ask them later. Um, and I would like to continue with our next speech, speaker, who is Anai Ayala. Um, and as I mentioned before, she's currently working for UNHCR, but she will be sharing her experience from being a humanitarian consultant. And she will be speaking about how we as frontline negotiator manage our legitimacy to operate in this context and the legitimacy of the organization that we are working for. So I'm very happy to give you the floor and I looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm actually already starting with the wrong slide, I think. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure. Um, what 
I will be talking today is um, um, I'm using as, a, as an example the um, Ebola crisis, but uh, what I'm really been looking at is rather than uh, what we do uh, to um, tackle misinformation and disinformation uh, when or in the time in which they're happening, I'm actually looking at what we do after, like what we do after misinformation and disinformation has already come into the scene. And we know we have already lost the trusting relationship that we have with the communities that we're working with. And the Ebola virus this epidemic was definitely uh, the, the kind of like best example in that sense, because um, the trust was lost pretty soon. And it was a loss of trust that was almost uh, all encompassing in terms of people losing trust towards uh, uh, the authorities, people losing trust towards the humanitarian communities, people losing trust between, uh, between each other. Now, the situation there, um, and that's also interesting to keep in mind in terms of what kind of landscape do we find when something happens and we have um, a proliferation of misinformation and disinformation uh, within a given uh, phenomenon or either within a given emergency. In this case, um, Liberia was a country where, um, first of all, there was already a very weak media landscape. There was uh, a very uh, strong mistrust towards the army and the army was heavily involved in relief operation. There was a long history of uh, conflict with, uh, in general, Western countries and long history of colonialism. And therefore, there was a very strong perception towards um, white people coming into the country for the response. And generally speaking, at the beginning of the emergency, there was very poor engagement with the communities because when the humanitarian community arrived, the emergency was already at the top of it. Um, and generally, there was also quite of a weak uh, trusting system with the government and in general national authorities. And this was already there since even before um, the, um, the Ebola outbreak. The information landscape on the other side was quite, um, was quite interesting too, because word of mouth was actually the very first and very most important way in which people were exchanging information. So very hard to track very hard to see, very hard to figure out what's going on unless it's, it has already happened. There was a huge mistrust in between local media and humanitarians at the point where there was no exchanging of information in between the two. Humanitarian organizations were saying certain things and sharing certain type of information. Local media were saying something completely different. The geography of the country and the access to ICT or in general to national information sources was quite um, difficult uh, because it basically uh, um, the country had uh, was had very little communication means and there were a lot of areas that we would call dark spots where there were no access in terms of information. And one other component that was very interesting and very determining in terms of misinformation and disinformation was that there was a huge diaspora community, mainly based in the United States, that would take information from international media and then bring them back into Liberia uh, through people that were actually still family members that were still living in the country. And that was interesting because uh, a lot of misinformation and uh, rumors that were going around um, throughout that period of time were actually coming from the diaspora community rather than from inside the country. Oh, sorry. So the result of that was quite a bit of a disaster um, in the sense that um, there were not just a lot of misinformation, but all of this information and rumors actually starting to have quite of a strong impact on the response. Um, uh, community health workers were attacked, uh, international organizations were attacked, Ebola treatment centers were attacked and burned down, and there were riots in uh, some of the major cities across the country. So it was what the realization there was that we had no time to go back to the community and say, well, now let's sit down and let's uh, talk about it. Because it was at the point where we couldn't even get close to the communities uh, to be able to talk to them. And so one of the things that we decided to do at the point was that we sat down and we said, okay, if we cannot build trust with us because that's lost, these people must trust someone. Who do they trust? 
Who are they talking to? And that mm-hmm. was when we started realizing that there was a network of mm-hmm. very trusted sources in the Not country. Enough. And uh, um, this network had, uh, you know, a lot of members in it. They had religious leaders. It had traditional leaders. It had teachers and nurses working in the small clinics. And it had local medias in it. So what we did then was to say, okay, if these trusted sources are bad sources of information, can we work with them to make them better? So rather than trying to rebuild trust with them, we relied on the fact that they already had the trust of the community and we started working with them so that they had the right information that then they could spread in the community or that they could provide to the community. On the other side, what we basically did was that we connected the sources that were trusted with the sources that were actually reliable. So we started getting doctors and nurses and epidemiologists to come and talk to media, to come and speak with government representative, to come and speak with um, religious leader and traditional leaders so that now the reliable sources of information were directly connected to the sources of information that were actually trusted in the community. What we learned from this is that basically people did not necessarily need to trust us. They needed to trust someone that was providing them the information that they needed. And in this way, we managed to build a system that did exactly that. So we built a network of local trusted actors and we were working through them. So we weren't even in the picture. So at that point, the realization was that we had, we if we had uh, put all of our efforts into trying to rebuild trust with us, it would have not worked and not in the time in which we needed to work. The other thing that changed in that was that through the system, we managed to get organization and responders to start coming to the table and being able to say, we don't know what's going on. We don't know how uh, to address this. We need help. We actually do not have all of the answers. So transparency became more part of the picture rather than we need to be strong and tell everybody that we figured it out, considering that you know it wasn't, it wasn't figured out for quite a long time. So the second example that um, I want to provide is an example that it's still uh, based in the Libyan on the uh, Ebola and uh, the Liberia case. But what we're looking at here is once we realized that we were able to rebuild that trust with the community structure, what we also realized was that in the long term, the the community had lost trust generally. And that started to uh, become evident when, for example, some organization launched some uh, vaccination campaigns after the Ebola outbreak and nobody showed up. And we started realizing that people had lost trust in the health system. They had also stopped trusting local institutions and local authorities and in general service providers. And that could have repercussion in the long term, especially at the time where the country was trying to rebuild their health system. So at that point, the the strategy was different because we realized that what we needed to do was really to work within the long term, right? And so what we realized was that the the only way that we could really tackle the entire kind of like landscape of misinformation and disinformation that was still going on um, in a pretty heavy way was to really look at all of the actors that needed to be involved in that in that landscape. And so we worked with the Ministry of Information. We started involving the national media unions and the media association. We worked with the humanitarian community and started informing them about what were the information gaps that were emerging in the areas where they were working. And then of course, we were with the religious leader and the traditional leaders And we also start training more actors on risk communication and what were the different factors involved into communicating properly with communities and making sure that communities had one landscape, one health information ecosystem, as as Sandrine was mentioning before. And, And the result of that approach was, again, we weren't looking at, oh, how do we get people to trust the truth? But we were really looking at, how do we get communities to receive one uh, kind of information and for that information to be coordinated and 
understood in the same way by all of the different actors that the communities are interacting with throughout the day, right? And so that was why the role of media, especially small local media, was very important. And what happened was that the ministry started actually talking to the different media outlets, which was something that wasn't happening in Liberia before. And they started to look at what kind of information media needed to have to provide then the right information to community. On the other side, the Ministry of Health realized that actually misinformation and disinformation had a huge weight on the strategy of um, the health sector in the country. And so started looking at uh, doing um, surveys and um, assessments to understand what was actually going on. And on the community side, what happened was that medical staff and uh, media started working together. So a lot of small radio stations in places that were very far from the capital started to create these programs where medical staff was invited to answer to the questions that the community had. So as to create a dialogue with the community that involved, again, the trusted source, which was a small radio station, if you want, and the uh, reliable source, which was the medical staff. And then um, one of the kind of outcome of that was uh, the creation of what at the time was called the rumors tracking mechanism. This was done actually under internews and that involved all of the different trusted sources that were identified um, throughout the project. So 25,000 community trusted sources that were using different type of ways basically to monitor what kind of information the community had access to and what kind of information they needed and now that information needed to be uh, provided to them. So in this case, looking at you know, a relationship that has been uh, broken and what do you do after that? What we really uh, learned was that the, the whole point was really to reframe the relationship rather than to bang on how much information can we put out, how much good information can we, you know, kind of like shower people with so that they believe us and then they trust us. It was really about, can we establish a different relationship in order to really connect the people that need to trust each other? And then really not focusing on who is not trusted and why, but really looking at, sorry, focusing on who's not trusted and why, rather than focusing on convincing the community. And it really, what we learned was that it really does take a village. Like the idea that you can counter misinformation or disinformation alone or as an organization or only do it for what it concerns you, it, it's not realistic. It's they never concern just you. They're never just about your organization. They're really about a much larger landscape. And, and we can use that landscape and, and work within that landscape rather than necessarily think that we need to be the first kind of like um, interlocutor of the communities in terms, uh, in terms of trust. And uh, I think I am uh, uh, done with this. Thank you very much, Anai, for sharing your experiences and these very interesting examples. Uh, we had some questions in the chat, so curious to have a conversation about this uh, a bit later. Um, I would now like to hand over the floor to Anastasia Marchu, who is currently working for the ICRC as head of subdelegation in Odessa in the Ukraine. And she will be speaking about different strategies, how frontline negotiators can rebuild trust with their counterparts when a damaging mis or disinformation campaign is going on on the field. It is a great pleasure to have you, Anastasia. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Let me try to put that PowerPoint on. Wait. Okay. So I think you see it, right? Great, thank you. Um, so first, a disclaimer, I will really not try to tell you about what ICRC thinks about misinformation, disinformation, what kind of frameworks we do have or working mechanisms for this. I will rather speak as the field worker that is uh, confronted by the effects of mis and disinformation um, here during our operational activities. And many thanks uh, for the first two speakers following a very sound grounding. And I hope that I will not be repeating the same stuff all over again, but actually be of uh, added value to our participants. 
So um, myths and disinformation, deliberate or not, it's one of the top issues that is affecting the humanitarian workers, their security and their access to the affected population, obviously. And here, the presumption of innocence doesn't work. Very often, people will choose to believe the most far-fetched and impossible allegations they can read online. Um, to react, to explain then, and to justify is by default a much, much weaker position than to communicate proactively. And this is one of the main messages of my presentation. So what changes when you find yourself uh, in a crisis? We all work in very volatile environments and um, circumstances can change abruptly over one night. And Ukraine is a really good example of this. It's true that the rumors, misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, et cetera, they have long existed and had the capacity to affect the work um, uh, of the humanitarian workers and uh, of the population, putting people at risk. But now what we see is the very rapid digitalization of our operational context. And now it's much easier, faster and cheaper for the stakeholders, including parties to the conflict, um, to spread the mis and disinformation, this harmful information, much at a much higher frequency um, with greater impact. And we see that Ukraine is basically the armed conflict happening online, when you can actually have access to the hostilities taking place on the ground. So what is important to remember is not to take the level of acceptance that you have in the context for granted. Even if you worked in the context for years already and you assume that your organization is so clear and known for your interlocutors. And when we talk about ICRC, it's an extra challenge because you know that the movement of the Red Cross and Red Crescent, that's really three different components. And it, sometimes in different contexts, it's super difficult to maintain our own identity. But the, when the crisis breaks out, well, everyone and everything will be questioned. There will be a very big surge of attention to what we do, how we do, and why we do. Our principles, our modalities will be challenged. And even if the operations have been going on there for years already, it's pretty likely that now they will fall under much bigger attention of the public. People who were not particularly interested in what the organization was doing until now might suddenly be following your every step meticulously looking for every single detail that they can use as a proof of your misconduct. Basically, when you're confronted by a disinformation campaign, all the good that you've done so far, either here in this context or elsewhere, it just makes very little difference in the people's minds. What matters is what you will do now. And remember that harmful messages travel much faster than the truth, and they also attract much more attention. Also, as we learned, the notion of neutrality is one of the hardest to accept by the population that is undergoing severe sufferings in the framework of a conflict. It's also the one that is the easiest to manipulate or misinterpret as insensitivity, as being kind of above the conflict, um, as if we tolerate the atrocities that are being committed on the ground. And it's super important to explain that neutrality does not equal to indifference. On the opposite, we care for all the affected by the conflict and we try, try to help everyone who needs us, no matter where they are, either willingly or because they uh, didn't have a choice. And while it is already a very difficult message to pass, it's even harder if, we do, if you fail to do so proactively with a strong voice and a very clear identity. If we don't speak, others will do so on our behalf. Others will come in on stage and will try to explain the way we work, but sometimes with a double agenda, sometimes misinterpreting what uh, the facts are and using this uh, to promote their own uh, things. Huh? And then this, was, this will force us to justify our principles ret retroactively when the damage is um, already done. And here, the most obvious example is of us striving to work on both sides of the conflict and uh, assisting people from both sides. When the temper, temper is running high, it's super hard to explain why we do that and why it's important for us to do this. 
but our acceptance is key to our security um, and uh, as well as uh, to our access to the affected population. With the speed with which information currently travels and with the volumes of misinformation and outright defamation campaigns of every step, every communication, no matter how small it is, it all matters and it can all affect our perception. And this is not only and not so much on the issue of our reputation and our image, it's only the tip of the iceberg, but um, a much bigger issue is the risks that this kind of things pose for the people that need us the most. As we say, the first casualty of mis and disinformation is the truth, and the imminently the second one is the trust. Um, our access to the affected population doesn't come for granted. It's a matter of everyday hard work to gain that trust and also resilience towards po uh, possible disinformation about you. We also see that um, very often international organizations, especially the big and the well-known ones, are seen as, uh, well, those with magical powers, basically, those that can um, solve everything, stop the conflict, feed all the hungry, you know, uh, find the missing loved ones, etc. The expectations are tremendously high, and the explanations of why we can't do it all are often seen as excuses. And yet, we must be very transparent about it, about our limitations. We don't have a magic wand. We are not superhumans. And let's acknowledge this. In the context of Ukraine, what we see is a very um, strong movement of uh, civil society, volunteer initiatives that are very fast to react. They are very fast to organize themselves into groups. Uh, they provide food to the internally displaced people. Uh, they go in uh, the, uh, the hot spots and try to evacuate people uh, with their own means, etc. And then when people, stakeholders, population, authorities, when they see that the international organizations are often much slower to gain the pace, they are much uh, more complex uh, with the procedures, with the procurement, etc., they might also think uh, that we are just not effective enough or that we are not trying enough. So uh, when you prepare for your negotiations for, let it be a meeting or perhaps a field trip to a new location, it is crucial to anticipate the questions which your interlocutors, even the most long-standing ones, can raise. We, can, we are all very exposed to social media. We are on our phones almost 24 seven, especially when the conflict is ongoing. We see tons of publications and so do your interlocutors. So brief your team, have a brainstorming session about what to expect and prepare very clear and simple and most importantly, truthful answers. Even if your counterpart doesn't like your answer, your honesty is gonna be appreciated. And what I also find very useful when talking to people is to be very practical and to be down to earth. If you can't do it, just say so instead of raising the false expectations. And of course, we need to always follow up on our commitments. Um, as we always say, you know, um, to gain a trust, it's a really long and painful process, but to lose it, it will take just one mistake or one disappointment. Um, also, giving your communication a human touch rather than citing the legal framework uh, that is the basis for your activities is often much better perceived by the public. So relatable experiences or expressed sympathy or even active listening, it will definitely build you, uh, help you build a much stronger relationship than just references to international agreements. Uh, for example, an experience that we faced here in Ukraine uh, a couple of months ago was that uh, when uh, trying to approach some of the areas, we have to go through lots of checkpoints that are obviously meant by um, weapon bearers. And there, uh, they were asking us questions about our activities, about why we do this and not that. Obviously, they were very much exposed to everything that was going on online. And we realized that, of course, you have to take time and explain and talk and uh, also invite to ask questions. But then uh, um, can you really do this to every single weapon bearer that you meet at the checkpoints? Not necessarily. Uh, perhaps a better idea would be to try to um, 
tackle this from institutional point of view to talk with the uh, higher ranking with the someone from the system but then to make sure to not only talk to the uh, leadership and explain and then trust on that person to cascade the information down about you even if they promise to do so but try to come up also with some activities like for example in our case first aid training for the weapon bearers where you can also use this platform of direct communication with these people to actually address those questions that are on their mind so instead of letting them think about it on their own, you actually create an opportunity for them, a safe place where they can ask you these questions and clarify things about you. So uh, when you talk with your interlocutors, try not to leave any gaps or speculations or doubts and be prepared to not only answer the questions, but invite them to speak more. Leave space for explanations and don't assume that everything is super clear. And um, another really important thing to remember, and that's linked to the poll that was in the beginning of the webinar, is that very often by not addressing the issue, by just leaving it there and waiting for the whole crisis to calm down, we are actually not doing ourselves any good. Instead, what we might face is that the, the, what was an allegation is turning into a fact in the people's mind, because there was nothing that could really change their mind about it. Um, you might also understand that during your negotiations or your conversation with the interlocutor, they are not agreeing with your modalities. And it is, it's absolutely okay. And those who have done the peer workshops of CCHN, they know all those tools of how to prepare for your negotiations. And we know that um, basically the goal of your negotiation is not to convince your interlocutor that your modality is the right one, not to convert him or her into your own belief, but to try and align as much as possible while still adhering to your fundamental principles, because they are the ones who make us who we are. And finally, <clears throat> we have to um, reach out to as many as possible, both offline and online, to build a proper understanding of our work and our mandate. In the middle of an information crisis, uh, your own means of communication, your Facebook pages, website, et cetera, might not be the most effective ones because there is still this concern of credibility of information. So when you do the stakeholder mapping, again, another tool to prepare for your negotiations, um, think of also of those influencers who enjoy a high level of credibility with the community that you work for. Um, for example, um, if your organization is building a pipeline to a town that had been recently affected by the hostilities, obviously it's a great, uh, very expensive and uh, very important project for that community. And if you and when you communicate about it by your own channels of communication, you will reach some of your target audiences. But if a mayor of that town communicates about your project, well, then the, uh, it's going to be an absolutely different impact. Firstly, he's likely to be followed by many of our direct beneficiaries, because again, we are in this uh, social media world now. And secondly, he'll be seen by them as a source of official and then credible information. And then lastly, if something doesn't work, and it's very likely in all the contexts, if you can't get the right supplies on time, you can't access uh, certain locations, or you can't provide information to the inquiries, or you can't tell um, the families of the prisoners of war of the missing ones where they are. If this doesn't jeopardize your overall work, then be sure to communicate about your attempts. As my colleague who is actually present here today at the webinar put it quite recently, get caught trying. It's okay if we can't do everything, huh? but if people don't know that we are working on it, that we are doing our best, they will just assume that we are not doing anything. We are successful and our negotiations are successful if we are perceived as trustworthy, transparent, and very sensitive to the environment that we work in. And that is all for me. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Anastasia, for these insights and very practical points um, we've seen in the chat that they were very, very much appreciated. Um, we had a few questions around in the chat for, for the speakers. Um, they're usually addressed to one of the speakers, but I'd really like to address them to, to all of you. 
um, and sort of hear your insights as well from, from the different perspectives. And of course, also the audience, you're most welcome to contribute as well to the questions asked. I would like to start with a, with a question that was being put um, to you, Sandrine. Um, it's from Anna Paula, who asked, who should be in charge of building the relationship with the sources of information that the communities trust? So I'll uh, maybe give you the floor first, Sandrine, and then we will see what Anastasia and Anai think about this. Yeah, that's a really, really great question. And um, that reinforces my point about how this is not a comms issue. Um, for me, this is um, an operations issue. So this is really the responsibility of the operations. Um, now, which part of operations up to you? In our case, if it's any kind of medical teams in the um you know, in the local health system, then it would be our medical coordinator. You may find that, you know, there's someone in your health promotion team that is very well connected. Um, that's great. It really depends on who the different influencers are. But for me, this is an operational responsibility. Um, so we're really trying to include our heads of mission and our project coordinators in this kind of analysis. Thank you very much, Sandrine. And maybe it will be interesting if I may, Anastasia, to hand over to you because you are actually not a communications person, if I understand correctly. So I'll hand that over to you as well, Anastasia. Thank you. But actually, I would completely agree that this is indeed it's not a calm issue. Um, here it is to show a very tangible result of our work. And that is the most helpful part of uh, building trust uh, with the uh, influencers that we want to communicate uh, sometimes on our behalf or together with us or about us. Uh, it's basically to provide them, it's our task to provide them with the most credible information about our activities. And that comes from our operational uh, framework, obviously, not necessarily from the um, communication part of it. So, yeah. Uh, that's all for my side. Thanks, Anastasia. Anna, do you have anything to add? Oh. Has everything well, been I would, Yeah, I would say that definitely for me is always field. Go to the field as closer to the field as you can, as closer to the communities as you can, because relationships are personal. Trust, you build it in person. You don't build it via call center. You don't build it through a suggestion box. You don't build it through remote interaction. It needs to be a trust that is built with the person, you know, face to face. So I, I always kind of like my first uh, kind of like candidate for this is always as closer as you can to the community. Thank you very much, Anahi. And I think your responses, all of you are really, really interesting because I've mentioned before, we're right now in a peer workshop for communications officers. And I think one of the challenges that were also identified is that sometimes there is this gap between, between field and, and communication and, and not enough communication actually between the two of what is experienced in the field, what are we communicating about, and then, then we have this, this decalage between the two. So very interesting conversations. Actually, Anahi, since uh, you have the floor, uh, I'd like to, to give another question to you that was actually very specific to, to your case. It's from Benjamin Metre, and uh, he was curious from both of your examples, which category or which people in the society the communities trusted the most? Which were the people that you could really use as mediators for your cause? Um, in, in Liberia specifically at the time, it was religious leaders and traditional leaders, which were actually separate. Um, and then it was specific members of the society, like for example, the teacher that had been there for a long time, was a member of the society, knew all of the kids. And then you had um, when where there was there were these very tiny radio stations that were broadcasting literally maybe fifty meters a hundred <laughs> no probably more but like they were literally broadcasting around a couple of kilometers uh, radio and and those were the communities living there really trusted what was said uh, on the radio regardless of if the people there were actually people that were providing trustworthy information which was. Uh, uh, quite interesting. It was very much a trusting mechanism that was hyper local. 
it was within the village and within the village sometimes it was in between different ethnic groups so it was very very hyper local thank you anahi and i think if we if we take this question maybe a, a bit broader uh, i'd like to maybe if i may give the ball to to you sandri because you're also speaking about more global campaigns or maybe more on on social media um do you have tactics there as well to find trusted sources in there that the communities trust so how do you go about that uh, yeah i think this i would say i mean just to to share with you honestly about that i think because it's actually um of the responsibility of a lot of different people and you have lots of different types of influencers right i mean you can have you know like anastasia was saying your local mayor so the counterpart would be your head of mission or your project coordinator who's in the field then you might have you know like the medical doctor then you might have religious leaders you might have a certain person who's the networker for that kind of group then you might have like your patient groups um, so my view is really is that it, it's a responsibility of the whole mission and it should be, I think someone in the comments or, or maybe one of the presentations was talking about the stakeholder analysis. I think it was you, Anastasia, actually, or, um, you know, really kind of looking widely. Um, and it's not necessarily the powerful people who are influencers, right? It can be, you know, you have like, I don't know, musicians or kind of youth groups. You also have um, like women's groups or, you know, your patient groups who may not seem like the most powerful people, but within your little dimension, they have a certain influence. So, um, yeah, I think I think it's really it's it's really um, it needs a kind of power analysis, really, and a stakeholder analysis. Thank you very much, Sandrine. And uh, now that you're mentioning the, the musicians, it reminds me of an example uh, on a mission as well, actually, in Ebola mission, where we have mobilized um, the local football team because they seem to be the ones who have the most credibility, actually, to, to pass the messages. So also very interesting to see we have to think outside the box. Sandrine, handing back over to you. <laughs> yeah, no, just to say, and also, um, you know, I'm sure you all remember when, when uh, uh, we had the various presidents during the COVID outbreak giving really false medical information. Um, you have kind of this counter influencer um, effect of that is incredibly dangerous. And that happened in quite a few countries. Um, we have very powerful people making, you know, and you can even think of Nicki Minaj and her uh, famous <laughs> statements about COVID, which uh, created all kinds of panic. So, um, yeah, so I think there's also kind of like countering these powerful uh, negative messages. Absolutely. Thank you, Sandrine. Anastasia, would you like to come in on that as well? Yes, actually, yes. I would like to add also that um, what we see now when we analyze these defamation campaigns, the thing is that uh, they are now aiming not necessarily at officials or really powerful stakeholders. They are aiming at community as the whole, at every single member of that community. And therefore, your reaction and counteraction is also, it's not enough to find one powerful person who can go on stage and say, no, that organization is actually good. It will not actually help you if there is a mass of people, grassroots level, uh, that don't think that way. And here we know that with social media, it's actually very easy to spread misinformation, especially of the very wild character that, um, you know, it gets uh, duplicated. So it was it gets shared very easily. And then you, you really don't know anymore what's the source of this information. And this is very important to take this into consideration, the complexity of this, that actually, if previously was coming top down, now what we see is that uh, there is this uh, demand being artificially or naturally created at the grassroots level. And then it goes up to the moment when the officials or the really powerful stakeholders can't ignore it anymore. And they have to, um, to yeah, to tackle this also because we are all living, we are political creatures and we are all living in the, in the politics. 
Um, and uh, there is also this issue of uh, the president, for example, not being able to completely disregard what's happening at the grassroots level because these people are going to then vote for him at the next elections. So it's a very complex, multidimensional thing. And of course, it's much, much easier to start a defamation campaign than to counteract it. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. Sanjin, you've mentioned uh, in your presentation that there is a difference between how people present themselves online and, and offline. And you mentioned we might come back to that. And I think it would be very interesting to hear from, from you what, what you actually meant with this. Yeah, so I think what's really interesting, I mean, again, this is a this is almost like digital anthropology, but there is a certain sort of performative aspect about our online selves, right? We want to present our best selves. And we may take quite extreme positions um, online that don't reflect the kind of nuance and doubt, etc. And I think, you know, what we learned from our studies on misinformation is that you know, if you look at like COVID vaccine hesitancy, actually a lot of it has to do with people just having questions or having doubts. Um, and so actually being able to have an offline discussion with the community where you can talk about nuance, you can really kind of question rather than labeling as, you know, this is misinformation or this is, you know, you've got the wrong idea. Um, actually the offline part is, is extremely important because you have this nuance. I think it's very difficult also when people take a position online, say they say, okay, I'm not gonna take the vaccine, um, then for them to back down, right? So it's, I think we just have to approach this in a very sensitive way and not necessarily read, you know, what people say online, what the community says online as the, position. It may have a sort of performative element. It may be about showing that you support someone. It, so I think I just want to make that nuance between kind of real life and and what's online. Um, yeah. Thanks, Andrina. I also and put I, a question oh, in the going. chat. <laughs> I put a question in the chat to Andre. No, oh, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, ask your question, Andre. No, I was looking in the chat and I just saw that you mentioned, Andre, these listening points. I'm I'm intrigued. So tell us a bit more. Yeah, uh, thank you very much and uh, for all of you colleagues and for Anastasia, with whom we have been uh, fighting side by side with the disinformation, having lots of skin in the game as we were those who didn't uh, leave our areas of responsibility throughout the uh, the escalation. Uh, one of the examples which comes to my mind regarding listing points is something I discussed uh, with our uh, former already HR director, uh, Gerardo Pontradolfi, when we had uh, been smashed completely. Uh, I was trying to defend on Facebook the visit of Peter Maurer to Moscow, the principle of neutrality received enormous uh, uh, criticism, let's put it this way. And then I went out with the post uh, asking people to tell how, uh, in what way we may have disappointed them. Uh, and maybe our principles uh, sh should be reconsidered and or we are failing to live by them. I, I just pulled out the opinions of civil society, uh, journalists, decision makers, uh, and that softened the reaction a bit uh, and then more and more because uh, when we let people this voice their concerns we may see that what we have some concerns are completely ridiculous we used to get crazy ideas about ICRC operations a while ago, like uh, people thinking that we are on uh, front lines cutting people on organs, but that has a positive side. People perhaps think we are on the front lines. Uh, that uh, We can see that there are 
tons of misconceptions we can deal with uh, this so-called Hanlon's razor that we should not assume uh, that uh, something that can be explained by lack of understanding stupidity should be attributed to bad intention but basically uh, being willing to hear listen to be seen trying to be caring helps a lot uh, when people are in crisis they don't need to be taught about ihl especially if we cannot help it was easy for me to defend what we cannot do because uh, nasa was alone on south basically state of february 24 there were her and one more colleague how can they do evacuation from her son there are two of them uh, and but uh, asking people usually the good thing is when we listen we start to realize that 90 percent or even more of criticism for uh, our operations was do more not to get out that we don't want you but we want you much more and that's something we can work with when we rebuild trust when we show uh, that we are willing to risk a bit to be a bit wild and uh, we also care and, uh, but genuine conversation uh, readiness to ask what we did wrong may really open up the gaps uh, we can then address like we didn't call back and people assume that this is a sign of disrespect not of the fatigue or it's, yes people think we're superheroes we remember everything etc we didn't uh, ask people's opinion that's something to learn to do and to let people teach us that's when they start to like us the, the not because we do a lot of good things to them but actually because we let them do good things to them provide access uh, care about us and when uh, some stakeholders of highest level recognize that we are willing to go willing to do uh, the risky things they were starting to put on resources to ensure we survive because they started to value our presence dialogue but the uh, listening points is something I would really like to spread into all organizations when we prepare for the meetings yeah. is to be ready to learn from others. And that builds trust as well, because communication is a two way street. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you very much for that. I've also seen a, a very interesting comment that goes maybe a bit also in strategies to to counter certain campaigns by, by Sana uh, Busbir. Uh, Sana, would you like to come in briefly and talk about your experience as well? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm trying to um, switch on the camera. Hi, very good to see you all. <laughs> Thank you for the great conversation and for the great insight you gave on this disinformation and uh, your, your past experience. Um, I shared earlier, but in a private message with Barbara, that uh, from now on I'm um, uh, working on a fact-checking uh, project uh, in terms of humanitarian and uh, migration, specifically in Western Africa, and it's involving also uh, the actors. Um, so I was trying to make it shorter than this, but this was a very big comment. I, uh, I was trying to, to, to reflect on one situation um, that in a normal situation we would uh, react in a very uh, framed um, approach, uh, like with having someone that will be checking the information, checking about the communication environment and the background behind that, uh, or a team doing this. Um, and but when we are in the field and then we we, we are facing some uh, of this uh, disinformation campaign that can be very harmful not only for the organizations but also for the whole sector itself but also for the person of, of concern um, it's difficult uh, like the negotiator cannot be do this by its own and then if I uh, recall the structure of some organizations in Ukraine, for example, because uh, you, you were there, you are there, Anastasia. Uh, the, um, the teams are quite um, uh, downsized in order for them to, to react and to deliver uh, the support as fast as possible. 
there are a couple of tools that were, um, let's say, designed uh, in order for an operational team. And then, yes, I, I, I also agree on that, that this should be the role of the operational team uh, to support the negotiator or to support also the, the, the team in, in charge of the, of the actions in the field. Uh, there are a couple of uh, tools that were um, uh, designed in a certain way to make sure that uh, way to verify the, um, the disinformation campaign and to check whether this will be harmful for the mission, harmful for the persons of concern, or if we can just let go for the moment until then uh, this rumor or whatever this opinion would be just uh, disappear as it appears. Then we have a very bad recipe actually for this uh, for this uh, campaign to, 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 to rise and to, to the disinformation campaign to, to appear. This is like uh, the uncertainty and also uh, the, the difficulty of uh, an unstable situation in the field. This is one thing, but also the fact that uh, facts are verifiable because we know that from, from our uh, negotiations uh, tools also that facts are verifiable. Uh, unprovable, but at some point opinions cannot be proved, and then it's also uh, opinions arise, they are subjective. And in an uncertain and unstable environment, these opinions are just getting over and became facts, as you mentioned earlier, but then it will be very difficult then to, 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 to slow down uh, the advances of, of these uh, opinions and uh, subjective informations that are going and going through. In an ideal world, we would have an excellent partnership with institutions and journalists that would be doing their job also into, uh, for example, rising, uh, tackling disinformation by other uh, informations, uh, the facts and fact checking informations. And I think this would be a very interesting also solution uh, if we have a big team and then a, a very good operational team to install that one or two persons specialized into this. And then while the mission is going on, then at the same time, there is someone who's doing fact checking and also trying to tackle also the information. But then <laughs> we are in an emergency most of the time, and then it will be very difficult to, to do that. Uh, we need to fo focus sometimes on the sources of the disinformation, but also uh, we know also that our intervention it's uh, very much about um, uh, delivering our action also to, also to keep ourselves safe. So if we can at least uh, uh, install this kind of tools and uh, cooperation between, uh, I don't know, the HQ and some other journalist institutions and so on, this will be very interesting to do this before, uh, uh, before that the situation increases. And then the last point, so uh, because I don't want to hold everyone very much now. Um, uh, we, we, we are in an era, a 3.0 era, that we have not only social medias that can uh, be a vector of disinformation, but also different type of communication tools also that can um, that, that allows this uh, disinformation going fast and faster. At some point, uh, what would be uh, very interesting to see is whether we can use the same uh, means of information, same means and sources of information also to tackle the disinformation in one, in one point. And then again, uh, there are a couple of very interesting journalists and, and, and very interesting, um, let's say, influencers that we can use also into uh, supporting and tackling disinformation. So I, I don't think this is now the place for me to go deeper into details because it's a very interesting, very interesting topic and very burning topic at some point. Uh, we all remember this kind of campaign of disinformation happening because of vaccination during the Ben Laden time. And it was also what this kind of disinformation that was not of a beneficiary's uh, um, a beneficiary <laughs> benefits, but also uh, that also uh, endangered a lot of all kind of uh, development slash humanitarian support in the field. I will stop there, and I will be very happy to to continue this conversation whether uh, whether we we can uh, at any other moment. Uh, thank you very much, Fiorella, and it was very good to see you today. <laughs> thank you very much, Sana, for for coming in on this. Um, I would like to take uh, one last question that we had in the chat for for our panelists, and then unfortunately the time is already up for this very interesting session. It is a question from Rehan, who is asking, is leveraging information and managing this information, countering your counterpart's narrative, 
a power play with your counterpart to gain influence over the narrative or the community or other influencers? And then a follow-up question to that, how would one overcome an authority government limiting the communication of a humanitarian actor with the community in order to control the narrative? Difficult question. I'm looking at who's nodding. I saw Sandrine nodding first. So Sandrina, I will just throw the ball at you and then we will see what Anastasia and Anna you think about that. Sandrine, please go ahead. Yeah, mm, it's so tough. Uh, I don't have a like good solution for that. Um, I, I was actually just reflecting on um, uh, during the COVID outbreak, we actually got a, a, an email from our colleagues in, in Venezuela and the um, Ministry of Health had basically authorized the sort of health herbal remedy, I can't remember the name, um, which was kind of given the, the green light by the uh, presidency. Um, and the Ministry of Health had to sort of authorize it as a, as a treatment for COVID, or actually, I, I can't remember if treatment or prevention. And so our team was really worried about that, like how to handle it. Um, I think, you know, we, we can't fight, you know, the president or, you know, these, these authorities, if they're deciding to, you know, put out a particular false uh, piece of information with their own political agenda behind it. Um, there's very little we can do. I mean, we, if we fight it, you know, we'll get kicked out, and then that's that's you know that's it. Um, so I mean, basically, what we did is just to kind of avoid it as a topic, <laughs> in the sense that we didn't communicate about it, and we you know we didn't give our a kind of yay or nay about it, and I think you know, that's a sort of mitigation strategy that you can do just to sort of keep your diplomatic relations, but try and stay out of the politics of the information. I mean, in some cases, it just won't be possible. I mean, we've had in, in a couple of countries a, an active campaign against us by authorities. And, you know, we can try and use pre-bunking techniques. We can try and, you know, do all the things that Anastasia was talking about ultimately if they want to get you out they will get you out right um but yeah so I just kind of recognize the problem and um I think I don't know I think a lot of people actually have the experience of living in different realities you know the official reality and then the um lived reality and I think that um if you just focus on talking about what you do, if you focus on just immediate issues, you can kind of depoliticize uh, information that way. Um, but yeah, no good solution for that. Thank you very much. Um, Anastasia, would you like to add something to that or contribute? Sure, I mean, I'm not gonna say any eye openers here, but of course, whenever we communicate, um, it's not about the power struggle, it's about ensuring access to the population and security for our own stuff. And this is the overall objective of anything we do, basically. And it's not about having influence over particular communities or minds of people. It's about making sure that we are as effective in our operations as we can be. And um, here, when it comes to tools, uh, well, again, if there is someone who is blocking your activities there, the first thing to do is to analyze why actually you are being seen as a threat to that particular interlocutor of yours. And I really like this uh, method of uh, five whys. You know, like, okay, so why is um, he or she blocking you? Well, because they want to have the only, the only one access to the community. Why is that? And, and you keep asking yourself and then you might actually come to the underlying issue of what their vulnerability is, why they think that you might be a threat to them. And that will really help you to um, make your strategy. And it's not about communication strategy, really. It's about your operational negotiations there with your interlocutor. And yes, Sandrine is absolutely right, depoliticizing this as much as possible, making it very practical, making giving very practical examples that look 
um, your people are suffering and I can bring in the assistance. Let's look at the variant when I'm not there and I can't do this. Can you cover for all the needs? If not, then, well, how is that going to actually affect your perception within the community? You know, things like that. Um, again, I will just invite everyone to join the peer workshop of the CCA channel, the negotiation skills, and to go through all these tools because this is what really helps you um, structure. I mean, you all know this, and it's, it's again, it's not, not something, um, um, not a will, uh, but it helps you structure uh, the way that you approach every single negotiation session and to really analyze the motives of your interlocutor. And that will help you to structure your arguments much better so that they actually hit the soft spot with that person. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anastasia. And also, of course, the word of confidence in, in CCHN tools. Anahi, I am giving you the honor of the last word today. Ooh. Um, well, I would say that in, in, in both um, those things for me is interesting. Um, I had a very strong reaction when I read, you know, controlling the narrative. And it sounds a lot like either propaganda or kind of like, you know, controlling the information. And I thought that what's important for me is really the idea of a healthy ecosystem. And a healthy information ecosystem is a place where you never have just one source of information. You don't have bottlenecks, but you have an ecosystem where the community has the ability to cross-reference the information that they, they receive, to understand the information that they receive, to have access to the right tools and so on. So for me, the point is not, I don't care if someone decides after being provided with all of the information that they don't want to get a vaccine. For me, it's a success. As long as that information is based on their evaluation of the information that are available about vaccines, then the decision that they make, that's not my decision, right? It has to be their decision. For me, is that the creation of that landscape. If you have a healthy information ecosystem, then you don't control the narrative, but you're sure that people have access to all of the different information that they need to then be able to make their own opinion about it and then decide and make their own decision. Um, sorry for that. I'm sure that was a very interesting point. Um, it is, however, 4.30. Um, we have to close the session now. I would really like to thank the speakers today, Sanjin, Anastasia, Anahi, for this very, very interesting insight. I honestly think you have started a great conversation piece at the CCHN. I have already seen interest in joining a thematic group to brainstorm further on how we can maybe apply this to some tools, what are new tools. Um, we have already in the past with some community members developed a set of tools that are really in a preliminary phase and we would love to brainstorm with you further. So we will be sending you, all of you who have participated, a message where you can let us know whether you'd be interested in taking this further with us in the form of a working or thematic group. Thanks also very much to Stephanie Fairland, who is actually the architect of, of this event. She did all the work. I, I really just put on the jacket and uh, facilitated today. So thank you so much, Stephanie, for this. And of course, to our tech hosts, Ryan and Nico, for uh, making this event so smooth. Wishing you all a wonderful evening, and we hope to see you soon again. Bye, everyone. <laughs>